Right, this time the, the uh, case history is the Hurricane Katrina and uh, the New Orleans levees. And then we'll get back to, to finish the uh, effective stress calculations. And then uh, the topic uh, after that will be compaction. So we'll begin the lights and we'll talk about uh, uh, Katrina. So Katrina, we're going to New Orleans. Uh, you see uh, New Orleans right here, the Mississippi River, and then uh, uh, Lake Pontchartrain here. Um, so on 29 August 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and, uh, you know, th these are huge uh, wind and rain masses. The, uh, if you look at some of the numbers, uh, it's, the hurricane is about 250 miles in diameter, so that's uh, Houston, Dallas, basically. Uh, the travel speed is uh, relatively slow, 25 miles per hour, uh, but remember that uh, you cannot run that fast, so you cannot outrun a hurricane, and that's why it's better to evacuate before. Uh, the time on the levee is about 10 hours, 250 divided by 25, that gives you 10 hours. Uh, and the number of wave cycles is around uh, 6,000. So if you have uh, waves that are overtopping a levee, uh, you're talking about uh, 6,000 or so. The wind is, uh, has very high speed. Uh, approaching 200 miles an hour and uh, because of the friction between the wind uh, and the water the wind is actually pushing the water and that creates a storm surge so if the wind is blowing well, New Orleans would be here somewhere the coast and the hurricane is coming from the Gulf of Mexico the wind is pushing the water you have a storm surge that develops and this storm surge is going to attack the, uh, the coast. So you see here uh, the Mississippi River goes through New Orleans and keeps going in the Gulf of Mexico. You have Lake uh, Bourne right here, Lake Pontchartrain here, and uh, the hurricane is coming in this way. Anticipated storm surges are three meters at uh, Lake Pontchartrain. 4.6 meters on Lake Bourne, and then at Bay St. Louis, approaching 8.5 meters, which is huge. So you have a wall of water that's slowly, relatively slowly, because it's about 25 miles an hour, but this wall of water is rising 8.5 meters, so that's a three-story building of water that's coming at you. So here's some of the uh, results of this uh, flooding reaching rooftop uh, levels, uh, ships on top of uh, highways. Uh, you, you, can, you can see that the waves and the water level uh, can take some of these big ships and move them tremendously, uh, this, the tremendous distances. This is a barge. You can see the scale with the man waving his hand. Uh, another example that shows that the water was obviously very high because these, uh, and, and this is a security camera that uh, actually took uh, videos of the water overtopping the levee. So the levee is right here, and you can see the waves in the back, and then the water is overtopping the levee and coming onto the dry side. More of these. Uh, pictures of the water overtopping levees, uh, levee breaches, and uh, uh, tremendous devastation. So magnitude of the disaster, uh, 1,500 fatalities. Uh, to give you a sense of how large that is, uh, there are about 2.5, 2 2.6 million deaths in our country uh, every year. And the population is 320, 330 million people. 
So that's about uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.06 uh, uh, ratio. The damage, uh, you can argue about those numbers, but being quoted as high as $125 billion. Uh, by comparison, the country's budget uh, is about uh, $4 billion. So this is about 3.3% of the total budget. So huge impact uh, of that storm. So here is a cross section of New Orleans. You have uh, the Mississippi River here. You have Lake Pontchartrain on this side. And these are the levees right here at A and B. And basically, New Orleans is built at the bottom of a bathtub. And obviously, it's not a good idea, but uh, this is a place that's dear to uh, history and to a lot of people. And, uh, and, and the, the, the first settlers started to build you know, fairly high ground here, and as time went by, people started to expand and extend into lower and lower uh, areas. So here is an example of a levee right here. You can see the levee along that line. Uh, the, water, uh, the water came from this side, from the Gulf, overtop the levee. You can see some signs of overtopping here, but overall, this levee really resisted very well the overtopping uh, charge of the hurricane. By comparison, here is a levee that was overtopped and completely uh, eroded. The water uh, came from uh, this side. This is Lake Bourne on this side. The levee was overtopped and, and you can see there's not much left of it. Water overtopped the levee, and, but you can see that the holes are on the downstream, on the, on the, down, on the dry side of the levee uh, because when the water overtops the levee, uh, the, the water velocity accelerates and becomes very high at the bottom of the levee on the dry side. One thing to consider is the, you know, we designed, uh, you may have heard, we designed for the 100 year flood. And uh, the 100 year flood is, you might say as well, it can only happen once every 100 years. Well, that's not the definition. Uh, the 100 year flood is the flood that has one chance in the 100 to occur in any given day uh, or be exceeded. And so, the, and you can calculate the probability that you're going to get, if you know, if we design a levy for 100 year, let's say, you can imagine that the probability that you're going to get the 100 year flood during the 100 year life of the levy is quite high. Uh, in fact, uh, in our country, we design typically for the 100 year flood, uh, but in Netherlands, they design for up to the 10,000 year flood. Uh, so, and, and of course, the uh, you, you have to consider the value of the consequence when you make those decisions and also how much money you have. Because if it costs you uh, that much money, uh, then uh, there, there are some issues, some, some economic issues as well. Um, so here is a uh, uh, plan view of New Orleans. And the levees are dividing the area into polders, into regions. And you can see here, there's one levee, here's another polder, here's another polder, and so on. But we went to the levee, after, right after the, uh, the disaster, we went uh, on the levees and we collected uh, samples uh, where you see those uh, boxes. And we came back to the lab at Texas A&M University where we have a machine. Uh, the samples were in tubes like this. You, you remember how we take uh, sample tubes. And the sample is in gray. And we're pushing the sample out of the tube and water is flowing over it. You see the, the conduit where the water is flowing here. The tube is right here. You're pushing the soil with a piston out of the tube only as fast as it is eroded by the water flowing over it here, so that this surface remains at this level. And from this, 
uh, measurements, we measure the velocity and the rate at which we, we push the piston, which is the erosion rate. So for each velocity, we have an erosion rate. And that gives us the coordinates on one uh, plot like this. This is the erosion rate. In this case, we have shear stress instead of velocity. But point by point, we can describe this curve that we call the erosion function. So we created uh, these erosion functions for all these samples that we collected in the New Orleans levees. And you can see the first thing. So this is the erosion rate versus velocity. And uh, these are different samples from the different levees that I mentioned earlier. The first thing that strikes you is that it's all over the place. And so that, that means that those levees are made from materials that vary from very high erodibility in this case all the way to low erodibility. <clears throat> and if you, if you then go, uh, you know, we had the, the camera shot that I showed you, the security camera. Uh, we knew, for example, and in this case, the levee had been overtopped, or we had other evidence like ships being on top of the levee or on top of the highway. So we knew which levees had been overtopped and which had not. And from those that were overtopped, we knew which ones had resisted and which one had uh, failed. And you can see here that all those levees resisted the hurricane and did not breach. But all those levees uh, actually breached. Uh, so the solid circles, levee breaches, empty squares, and so on. So that allowed us to prepare as a result of uh, this uh, post-disaster investigation to create a, a chart, if you wish, that uh, uh, would allow the engineer to go on this chart, erosion rate versus velocity, make some measurements on the soil that is being or likely to be eroded in the future, and then decide if uh, the uh, the uh, material is going to sustain uh, the res or resist the, the hurricane. Now there is two red lines here. The, this red line says that there will be a failure in two days. This uh, red line here shows that there will be failure in two hours. And the two hours is associated with a hurricane, whereas the two days would be associated with a flood in the river. Uh, the good news about the hurricane, if there can be good news, is that it doesn't last long, whereas a flood in the river lasts a lot longer. So that allowed us to uh, do this. And, uh, and of course, the Corps of Engineers, and uh, with the money that the taxpayers gave them, built a number of new defenses. And you see here a uh, storm surge barrier with the gates here, so New Orleans is on this side, the storm surge barrier that's been built since the disaster to protect New Orleans and increase the level of protection that's afforded to the inhabitants of the, and of course that costs billions of dollars. All right, so that's the end of the uh, case history. Let's uh, go back now to the uh, to what we were talking about, <clears throat> and I want to finish uh, the uh, discussion that we had on the effect of stress. And you remember that the effect of stress, we wrote the equation sigma prime equals sigma minus alpha u w for the normal stress. And that for the shear stress, we had tau prime equal to the effective shear stress is equal to the total shear stress, but the normal effective stress is the total uh, uh, normal stress minus alpha, the area ratio, times UW. And we had practiced a few things. I want to do problem 10.16. So let's do problem. 10.16 on page 277. So we 
have a, a number of input and we have a, a layered system and the system has a ground surface and there is a groundwater level five meter deep. So groundwater level five meter deep. So this, this is five meter. But I have the capillary zone that rises to three meters. So you have a capillary zone here. So this is capillary zone. And then this is um, above the capillary zone. This is the groundwater level. And uh, so we say this is three meters, this is two meters, and then it goes down to another two meters below that. So we'll go down another two meters, and that will be the bottom of our investigation, if you wish. We have to calculate the uh, effective stress profile, the sigma prime here, as a function of depth. And we do that in steps. The first thing we do is to calculate the total stress, because it's simply gamma z. And we'll call it zero for before anything is built and vertical so sigma zero V. Uh, I forgot to give you some of the uh, unit weights. The sort is uniform. The unit weight is 20. Gamma total equal 20 kilonewton per cubic meter. And uh, gamma water is 10, and this is uh, uniform soil. This material here is saturated because it's below the groundwater level. This material here is saturated by capillary action, the water goes up. And then this material is unsaturated. that the entire, <coughs> that the unit weight is 20 everywhere to simplify the calculations. All right, so um, we are going to calculate, so the, the total stress at the surface is zero, because there's nothing above it. Uh, total stress at this point is going to be 60, because it's three times 20. Uh, total stress here is going to be uh, 100 because it's 5 times 20. So right here we have 100. And then at the bottom uh, we're going to have uh, 7 times 20 or 140. Okay. So that's the profile of sigma 0b. Then we are given the, uh, or, or we're, let's discuss the water stress, UW. So UW is the water stress, can be compression below the water level and tension above the water level. So we know that this diagram will go through zero at the groundwater level because you're essentially at the surface of, uh, of a water body. And it increases below that at a rate of 10 kilonewton per, per cubic meter per meter of depth. So that means that right here, we're going to have 2 times 10 or 20. In the capillary zone, the water Go in, goes in tension, and the, the diagram continues to be um, linear. So this number is minus 20, because we have 2 meters right here. 
And then beyond that, uh, because the material is unsaturated, uh, the water tension becomes larger and it's more difficult to calculate. So this number, I forget what I put, is uh, minus 400. All right, so this is minus 400. So quite a bit of tension in the, in the water because remember, the sun says come over here, the sea casts it, uh, you're not going anywhere, and then the water is in tremendous tension between those two uh, poles of attraction. The next uh, thing that we need <coughs> is the alpha value, uh, the area ratio. And I mentioned, and if I didn't, I'll put it here, that alpha, a uh, first estimate of alpha is the degree of saturation S. V water over V void. So alpha uh, is varies from zero to one, and you can see that here the material is saturated, so it's going to be one right here. Here the material is also saturated, so it's going to be one all the way to here and all the way to there. So this is one all the way there. And then we're going to assume that we have a gradual decrease in alpha value uh, all the way to the surface where the material is completely dry. There's no water. The degree of saturation is zero. Then we need to form uh, the quantities. We're going to form alpha uw, and then we're going to subtract it from sigma 0v to obtain sigma prime 0v. So here is the quantity alpha times uw. So I did that, and I get a profile that, so right here, 1. So it's going to be the same as uw. Maybe I should, let me push this over so we can see better. So I'll push, because I need to have some room to put something negative. Okay, so that's the C, and this is zero right there. So 20 at the bottom, zero right here, because I'm forming uh, 20 times one, and then 0 times 1, and then minus 20 times 1, so I'm still at minus 20 here. And then this shape, so this shape, I have a hard time uh, forming it because I didn't give you the equation of this, but let's say that it goes to minus 100. Okay, so all this is, um, you know, if you take this course, 50 years from now, okay, you probably will have the equation of this within this course, Introduction to Geotech. But right now, we don't have enough knowledge, and it's beyond the scope of this uh, uh, course to be able to talk about this uh, particular variation here. So then we're ready, by difference, to create the effect of stress, sigma prime zero V. So sigma prime zero V is going to be this one right there minus this one. So let's start at the bottom because that's uh, the easier one. I got 140 minus 20. So here I'm at 120. And then I've got another point here, 100 minus zero. So here I'm at 100. Let's do the top of the Kepler result, 60. And then I didn't write what this one, this was minus 20 here. So I've got 60 minus minus 20. Sigma minus 
alpha uw. Alpha uw is negative. So now the water stress is increasing the effective stress, which represents what's happening. Uh, it's a measure of what's happening between the grains. So where was I? 60 minus, minus 20, I'm at 80. Okay. And then if I go to the top, I've got 0 minus, minus 100. So right here, I have 100. So then the profile of effective stress looks something like this. Uh, and, and that shows that towards the top of these soil deposits, where you have a relatively low water level, uh, like around here, you know, we have a water level that's maybe six, seven meters deep. And then we have capillary action, and then the, the sun uh, increases this uh, UW negative tension. It look, the effect of stress, the, the amount of stress that is between the grains close to the surface is relatively constant. And that's one of the reasons why <coughs> the strength distribution of, of these materials uh, is relatively constant. Okay? So that's a problem on... Uh, let me move to the next topic, which is compaction. So very likely to get a, a problem like this uh, in the midterm. <clears throat> so when the soil is not strong enough to be able to resist uh, the loading from uh, the foundation or from the building, we have several choices. Uh, one of them is to compact the material, <clears throat> to densify it, to strengthen it. Uh, another one is to mix additives like cement or lime <coughs> to strengthen them. Another one is to go deeper with the foundation. I mean, there's a number of techniques to uh, try to improve the situation. Compaction is one of them. And uh, uh, you can compact the material by uh, rollers. So this is typical of when you when you build a, a, a pavement. So you might have a roller like this, and there's a big drum that's uh, rolling over the, the material to, to compact it. So this is the material that you're trying to compact here. Uh, you have another type of compaction, uh, which consists of taking a big, uh, a big rig and to drop a weight, so you have a, a weight here that free falls, that free falls and makes a crater. Uh, this is called dynamic compaction. And this, this is roller compaction. And in the roller compaction, typically, we induce uh, some vibration. So the, the roller is not just heavy with a big weight, but it also has an eccentric mass so that the roller is heavy and, and, and uh, compresses the soil, but also it shakes it down. So there is a, a vibration, uh, vibrating roller compaction. So these are uh, some of the main uh, compacting devices. In this case, sometimes you will see some uh, rollers that are not circular. Uh, this is called uneven compaction. So the roller could have this shape, triangular shape, and it's rotating, and so it goes boom, boom again. And that, that way you have a larger impact and you can compact deeper layers 
but it's not as continuous. So there are the different techniques. Uh, there's also something called intelligent compaction, where uh, the, the machine is actually recording a signal uh, on the drum to get the acceleration and back calculate the stiffness of the material on top of which it's rolling. So, number of issues. But in all cases, let me erase this. In all cases, you go through steps that are common, and these steps include laboratory testing of the material to be compacted. So we'll write this. One laboratory test. And you're doing some of those tests in the lab. Two, you write specifications based on the results of these lab tests. Three, you check compaction in the field to make sure that you have obtained uh, the numbers, the quantities that uh, you wanted to uh, that you wanted to obtain. So we're going to talk about mostly about the lab test that you're going to be doing and the lab test is named after a fellow by the name of Proctor who developed this I believe in the 1930s or so. Um, the Proctor test, you have it on uh, table 9.4, so let's see, 9.4 and 9.5, that uh, doesn't make sense, page 182, oh yeah, here it is, so 9.4, page 182, Proctor test, what's called the standard Proctor standard Proctor test and that's table 9.4 page uh, 182 And so you can see the, the dimensions uh, of the mold. So you have a proctor mold that's about this size, four to six inches in diameter. And you put one layer of soil and you compact it by dropping a hammer on top of that layer. And when that layer is compacted into a certain number of uh, rows of this hammer, you put the next layer on top and then you're impacting that layer by the same number of rows and then you do a third layer, you impact it with a certain number of rows, and now you have filled this uh, container. And you weigh the container, and you uh, uh, measure the water content that uh, is the target water content that you've decided upon, and then uh, you repeat that test a number of times for different water contents. And you end up <coughs> with a curve that looks like this. Here we're going to put the dry density and here we're going to put the water content. And so you do one test, you mix the dry soil with a certain amount of water that you have chosen so you can get the right water content. And then you build the, uh, the sample and in the end you get a certain Get a dry density and a, for a certain water content. So you get one point on the curve like this. And then you take the sample out of there, you remix, uh, you redry the sample, you remix with more water, and you repeat the test, and you get another uh, point that might be here. You do that again with more water, and you see that you might be here for the next test. And then you repeat this, you dry the soil, you mix with some more water, 
and then you might get a point like this. So point by point, you generate the compaction curve. And maybe another point here. Okay, so this is called the compaction curve. This compaction curve typically has the shape of a bell and there is a maximum value we'll call this gamma d max and it corresponds to a, a water content that we will call the optimum water content so the coordinate of the maximum point here is the one that gives you the maximum dry density and the optimum water content. Why do we choose the dry density here? Well, let me give you an example of why we do that. Let's say that you have two soils, so I'm going to do the phase diagram. And those two soils are one cubic meter in uh, size. The first one just has solids and air. And the solids weigh uh, 18 kilonewton. The second sample has less solids, but it does have water. So it's got air, it's got water, it's got solids. And there are 14 kilonewton of solids and 4 kilonewton of uh, water. So if I calculate the total unit weight, gamma total, here I get the air weighs zero, so I got 18 divided by 1, I've got 18 kilonewton per cubic meter. If I calculate the total unit weight here, and my total as 14 plus 4, again I've got 18 kilonewton per cubic meter. Um, so from that point of view, both samples are equal. But if I do the dry density, here I've got 18 kilonewton per cubic meter, because everything is dry, so it's 18 divided by 1. But here if I do the dry density, then I only have 14 divided by 1. And in the compaction business, the, what's really important to us is to make sure we have as much solid as we can in a unit volume. So that's why the <coughs> total unit weight in this case doesn't help much, but you can decide on that basis you say, oh, I prefer this one than this one. So that's why we use the dry density rather than the total uh, or the uh, um, I should say dry unit weight, okay, density is another thing. So dry unit weight, maximum dry unit weight. When you write the uh, uh, specifications, so we talked about number two here, specifications. When you write those specifications, then you're going to write, uh, and uh, for the contract, to reach, say, 95% of gamma D max uh, within uh, plus or minus, or, or give uh, plus or minus 2% uh, of W optimum. So that, that's typically what you include in the specification. 
you want the, the, the placement and the compaction process here such that this material will be very close to gamma D max, 95%, and at a water content that's within plus or minus 2% of that optimum water content. So you do that in a specification. Now, as I mentioned, Proctor did this work uh, early in the 1900s. And as uh, construction developed, the machines, these things became bigger and bigger and bigger. And the compaction effort increased. Um, so the compaction effort that was described in the standard Proctor test became too small compared to what uh, was happening in the field. So that's when the modified Proctor test was developed. And the quantities associated with this uh, modified Proctor test are, table, are in table 9.5. Page 183. Right. And basically, the energy that's it's the same mold, but you have more layers. The hammer is bigger, uh, and you have more blows per layer. So the the energy level is higher than in the standard Proctor test. And as a result, the curve that you get is actually higher than the previous curve. So this is standard Proctor here. And this would be modified Proctor. Now, one more thing associated with <coughs> The Proctor test. At uh, let's identify point A here, and then we'll identify point B at the top, and then point C on the other side. It's uh, the same sample. But different water contents, okay? different water contents. At A, the particles are receiving this energy and they're pushing around and they're trying to compact themselves and rearrange themselves. But there's quite a bit of friction because there's not much water. At B, the uh, particles are lubricated, if you wish, and it's a lot easier for the same energy to compact the material to a smaller volume. At C, the water is starting to take uh, place, uh, of, uh, fill the voids, and now the particles are being pushed apart, so you have too much water and you cannot reach the same level of uh, unit weight <coughs> as you could. So that's why there is an optimum lubrication process, if you wish, between the particle, so that for a given energy, you can reach the maximum dry unit weight. And that's what you're trying to achieve in the, uh, in the field. Uh, so you can probably sense that there is a boundary here, a boundary beyond which these curves cannot migrate. And let's find out what that boundary is. And, and I have it here. And it's on page uh, 182. Okay, so we're going to uh, generate that solution to find the equation here of this red uh, line. So I'm taking a sample that has solids, water, and air. This sample has a weight of solids, Ws, a weight, this is zero, and then a weight of water, 
and then I'm just I just need here the uh, total volume. Uh, but you would also have volume of voids. Uh, let me put it as well. Just to complete the diagram, I'm going to uh, show volume of air, volume of water, and volume of voids. And here will be volume of solids. Uh, I'm going to express gamma D equal weight of solids divided by total volume. So total volume is right here, Vt. And then I'm going to express that the weight of solids is the unit weight of solids times the volume of solids. And I'm going to uh, express that the total volume is the volume of solids plus the volume of voids. Furthermore, I'm going to divide top and bottom by Vs. And I'm going to express uh, gamma S as Gs gamma W. You know, that's the definition of Gs, gamma S over gamma W. And then I divide by Vs top and bottom, so this Vs disappears. And here, divided by Vs, I've got 1 plus V void, whoops, V void over V solids. Okay. Then I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the degree of saturation. S, G, S, gamma, W, divided by, at the bottom, I multiply by S as well. S plus V void over V solids times V, S, uh, uh, S which is volume of water over volume of voids. So gamma D, I continue. I repeat this S, G, S, gamma W, divided by, and here I have S plus so I'm going to multiply top and bottom by WW, so the, the V void cancels here. But I'm going to multiply top and bottom, that fraction, by WW and WS. So I'm going to have V water, which is here. And I'm multiplying by weight of water and weight of solids. And so I have to divide by the same quantities to keep the ratio the same. Weight of water, weight of solids, that's what I multiplied here. And then I've got the Vs that's left. So if I write this equal, uh, I've got S, Gs, gamma, W, divided by S plus uh, this is water content, or, or one of uh, this, uh, sorry, WS over WW. Um, no, this one is water content, okay? And then WS over VS is gamma S, and uh, so the, uh, let's see, this is. Uh, This is gamma 1 over gamma w. Okay, so I've got gamma s, which is this one. This one is 1 over gamma w. And then this one is water content. And this quantity here is g sub s. So in the end, what I find is that the dry unit weight is equal to uh, S, G, S, gamma, W, over S plus G, S times water content. So this is the equation. 
you see that I have linked the dry density, dry unit weight, to the water content through the degree of saturation and the specific gravity of solids. And that is the equation, equation of, if I choose the value of S, and I'm running a bit over, but if I choose the value of S in that equation over there, I can find, so this might be S equals 0.9, and you have another one that's here that might be S equals 1. And that way you can see where these boundaries exist so that the compaction curve cannot go beyond, beyond this, uh, this type of uh, 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 this equation over there. All right. So we will see you next time.